So just for our listeners, when were GMOs introduced into our food sources? When so, did we start seeing that happen and how did that come about? You well, know, no approval, right. just, just like we talked about the, 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 this massive human experiment with no, you know, no boundaries. And when did this come into play? When was this, this allowed to start happening? Empowering you organically, delivering content you trust with results you love. Welcome everyone to another episode of Empowering You Organically. I'm your host, Jonathan Hunsaker. I'm joined by my co-host, Terry Ann Trevenin. Hey everyone. And we have a very, very special guest, Jeffrey Smith with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Excited to have you here. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jeffrey today. And yes, we're extremely excited to have him here. Jeffrey is the founding executive director of the Institute for Responsible Technology and the leading consumer advocate promoting healthier non-GMO choices. He was named the 2017 Person of the Year by Masters of Health magazine for more than two decades of work in 45 countries exposing how biotech companies mislead policymakers and the public and put the health of society at risk. In 2018, he and Amy Hart released Secret Ingredients, a documentary that highlights numerous individuals and families that healed from serious conditions after switching to an organic diet. He has featured a, his feature length documentary, Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives, was awarded the 2012 Movie of the Year and inspired millions worldwide to choose healthier non GMO foods. His books include Seeds of Deception, is the world's bestseller on, non, on GMOs, and Genetic Roulette, the documented health risks of genetically engineered foods. He has counseled government leaders and healthcare practitioners from every continent and has been quoted by thousands of news outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and Time Magazine. He appears on influential radio and television programs, including the BBC, NPR, Fox News, Democracy Now!, The Doctors, and The Doctor Oz Show. Uh, and I'm just going to add to this, Jeffrey is truly a trailblazer and a pioneer in leading the way and leading the conversation when it comes to GMO. So we're thrilled to have you here today. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Jeffrey, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you here. We, we saw you at Expo West uh, a year ago and you were telling us about the documentary coming out um, and then just saw you about a month ago. And so we're so happy to have you on here and let's talk about Secret Ingredients. Let's talk about the documentary that you released. You're also doing a very limited re-release of it, right? That well, what's happening is it, there's a big event happening um, mid-May, uh, May 15th, where we're going to show it for free. Don't tell anyone early. All right, you can tell everyone a week early um, that it's people can sign up and see it for free for that week. And what the, the movie is, I would have to say, um, the most effective and efficient tool at convincing people that they absolutely have to eat organic immediately. Now, I'll tell you how it works that way, but for the people, I mean, the people in your in your podcast may already be eating organic. I mean, the name is, is empowering. Empowering you organically. Yeah, I mean, like, so I think a lot of people in the audience are like, well, how do I get my mother or my brother or my spouse or my friend so this is this is the movie to share with them, and this is the week to share with them because it's free for a week. And I'll give you one story. At Expo West this year, I interviewed on my live Facebook uh, page um, a mother who shared the film with her teenage kids. And after seeing the film, the kids were angry at her for having allowed her allowing allowed non-organic food into the house. And so they all got garbage bags and emptied the cupboards of all non-organic food. Wow. I mean, this, this is what happens. This is what happens with this film. And uh, we're going to be providing people with an opportunity after they see the film for a way to more easily integrate organics into their life, not just the food, but also their whole lifestyle, their body care, their cleaning supplies, etc. Because we know from showing it, uh, for over a year in different first in fest food in, in festivals and then in making it available uh, online for purchase, it changes lives. People have that desire. But you know, there's some people that have the desire but don't actually do anything about it and they, it becomes like, oh, I should have done that a year ago. So we're going to help people. And tell me the URL so that our listeners yeah. know where to go. Sure. Secret Ingredients Movie. 
Dot com, secret ingredients movie.com. And on May 15th, they can watch it for free. Yes. Correct. So, yeah, I mean, what you said here, which I thought was very important, is how do you encourage others, right? Sometimes uh, we eat organically, a lot of our listeners I know eat organically, but sometimes others in our lives, whether it's our, our moms or our dads or friends, think that you're, what do you mean? Why are you eating organically? Or I never ate organically. Or mm -hmm. just, you know, there can be all kinds of different, um, criticisms around it and so I love the idea and this is a way that people can share this without it having to be on them right, right? hey this isn't me telling you yeah, all this people stuff. always say how do I convince my spouse I say you don't yes let me do it exactly because you're I discounted love <laughs> I love it so secret ingredient movie.com we're going to talk secret a lot ingredients of movie .com. secret ingredients plural yeah. movie.com by the way we will have links um, on the show notes empowering you organically so you can also go there I just want to make sure that everybody really is clear because this is it's so important I mean, we talk about the importance of organic ingredients inside of supplements. And then obviously we talk about that with food as well. Um, and so I just want to make sure that everybody that's listening to this goes and tunes in and watches it and then shares yeah, it. Yeah. And let friends. me just share and do it. Like I, I'm just going to geek out personally for a minute. We just did my health journey podcast last week. And one of the things that Jonathan asked me was like, you know, as I've gone down this journey of learning about natural health, organic, all those things, he's like, what was the first thing that you changed when it came to your health journey? 100% it was going to organic food nice. based off of interviews I watched with you. So mm -hmm. I'm super excited to have you here today so that our listeners can hear the same things that I heard that changed my life. And it's so funny that you're talking about it because... I've told Jonathan and our listeners many times that I get made fun of by my family and I love my family. They, they know they do it about eating organic food and I'm not perfect at it, but I'm really good at it and buying organic foods. And I think it's something that a lot of people face. They move to organic and they're like, really, do you need organic? You, tr you truly do. And I think when people hear what we're going to say today, just like it changed my life and I went from eating non-organic food to organic, I think it makes a, a, a profound impact on your body and your health and people need to listen up more. So I'm just really excited for the conversation I'm today. I'm excited to hear what happens when you share the film with your family. I want to hear that. I, I want to, <laughs> when I want, you said that, I was totally, like, I'm sending it totally, to all of them. Totally. I'm sending just it have to them, them watch it for free online. Yes. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. You know, it, it, I mean, people, I, people have said, I finally got my spouse family you know, to, yep. to, to change. Uh, so here's the here's the secret sauce. Here's the secret sauce as to why it works so much. People go, so why is it so important? In the film, all these people get better from different diseases and disorders just after switching to organic, organic food. Yeah. And 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 I'll give you some shocking examples. In the film, you will see two young boys, autistic, until their family switches to organic, and now they're no longer on the spectrum. A, a person who's a chiropractor who has a clinic, all these infertile couples, I'm not going to give too much information. I want to be a plot spoiler, but put it this way. She puts all the infertile couples on organic diet. All of them have children. All of them have children. People had cancer, skin conditions, allergies, bloated gut, brain fog. Now, if you think, well, how could it be that just switching to organic can change all of those things? Well, we have doctors like David Perlmutter, the best-selling New York Times best-selling author of Grain Brain and Brain Maker, and Dr. Michelle Perro, nearly 40 years as a pediatrician, one of the top pediatricians in the country, saying that this is what they're seeing in their own patients when they switch them to organic food. And we have numerous doctors saying after they get better on good food, they switch back for some reason. Sometimes it's just a meal. Sometimes it's a weekend. Sometimes they just fall off and their autoimmune disease comes back or their pain comes back or whatever their condition was comes back and then they realize the role of the food and the secret ingredients in the food. By the way, this is a cue. What are those secret ingredients, Jeffrey? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I wonder what your next question is going to be. And it's the secret ingredients in the food that's causing the problem. And the scientists put the link between those ingredients and the diseases. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. And I'm not going to ask you that question. Oh, yet man, I, want, I did my best. I, Jonathan, didn't I do my best? <laughs> you, you did do your uh, best. I wanted to, I want to go back in time a little bit. 
before we came to this place where we had this issue of GMOs, let's talk about the history a little bit so people can be educated where we went from people growing their own food and having control over what they were putting into their body to where we are now. Talk about that a little bit and, right. and what you know around that. So you're, you've, just, you've just described one of the two secret ingredients in non-organic food, which we blame for all these conditions. Not, it's not the sole blame, obviously, you know, the, the, the or GMOs and the other secret ingredient, which I'll be mentioning in just a moment, is not, is not the only thing that causes all these different diseases or disorders. But you will describe the incredible amount of evidence that, that makes one realize, oh my God, I better be careful. So GMO, genetically modified organisms, we see that now in so many products that say non-GMO. A lot of people don't even know what the GMO stands for, genetically modified organisms or organism. And it's traditionally been where you take a gene from one species and you force it into the DNA of another species. So you take bacteria or virus genes and put it into soybeans or corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, alfalfa. Those are the six main GMOs, all engineered with foreign genes and the main reason they genetically engineer is to allow that crop to be sprayed with herbicide. These are chemical companies making seeds that tolerate their chemicals. So normally, if you spray Roundup herbicide on soybeans, you can kill all the soybeans. But if you spray it on Roundup Ready crops, then the soybeans will survive. And now we have named the secret secret ingredient, which is Roundup. But you know, there's other herbicides also, but um, the main one that they genetically engineer uh, for tolerance is Roundup. And Roundup is nasty stuff. Well, Roundup, also known as glyphosate. Well, right, glyphosate so. is the chief poison in Roundup. Okay. Roundup is a bunch of things, but Monsanto got away with saying, it's the only poison that we have to deal with, even though there's another ingredient that's 10,000 times more toxic and other ingredients that are more endocrine disruptors and toxic as well. There's a whole soup of toxic stuff in Roundup. Roundup can be 125 times more toxic than glyphosate. But um, because of the laws now, uh, the EPA simply says, okay, name your active ingredient. They say, okay, glyphosate. They say, okay, will you please provide us with tests on your active ingredient glyphosate, forget about the whole formulation, forget about even using the type of glyphosate that's found in the formulation, use an, a, a safer variety and test that, and then we'll trust you with turning over the data that's accurate to us so that we can evaluate your product. Well, and don't test low doses because we're ignoring the low dose effects that can be even greater for endocrine disruption than high dose effects. So the EPA is basically they're taking dictation from the chemical companies as to how to avoid finding problems. And as you'll hear later in the interview, uh, Monsanto, which is now Bayer, because Bayer Aspirin, et cetera, bought Monsanto, they had, and ha they had a lapdog in the EPA that basically did what they wanted, and we have the evidence. So now we have Roundup, to get back to your question, Terry, and we have Roundup on one side, and we have uh, the, the GMOs that can be sprayed by that Roundup, and both are dangerous. And I'll give you an example. Dr. Seralini from France, he was, on, he was a toxicologist, is a toxicologist, was reading all the submissions from GMOs uh, uh, for approval in France and in Europe. And he was aware, oh my God, there's these GMO corn varieties and they have all sorts of statistically significant differences, which demonstrate signs of toxicity in the liver and kidneys Let's take it beyond the limit of 90 days that Monsanto limits their tests for, and let's do a two-year rat study, which is the life lifespan of a rat. It turns out they used Roundup Ready corn sprayed with Roundup, multiple massive tumors, premature death, organ damage. And so, wow, first time they do a long-term study with the rats and they have massive tumors that are like 25% of their body weight. They actually have to kill the rats because it's considered inhumane to let it live with a tumor that size. There's awful pictures of these deformed rats and tremendous death rate much earlier. And it, it showed that Roundup Ready corn is dangerous, but he did something which was brilliant. He put another group just on the Roundup Ready crop that had never been sprayed, the corn that had never been sprayed, 
and found that there was multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. Same thing. So, aha, it's the GMO, which means there's massive collateral damage in the GMO, which can give rise to allergies and toxins and carcinogens. But he gave another group just the Roundup without the corn, and they also had multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. So it was both the GMO and the Roundup, alone or together, that caused these things. And so this, it, there are problems with both. Now there's more research on Roundup, and I'll, I can describe how it, and I will, how it damages the foundations of health. I mean, the stuff that you're learning, like, oh my God, that's important for health, like microbiome, just destroys it. And then there's the GMO, which is like playing genetic roulette because when you insert one of those genes or do gene editing and rearrange genes within the same species, you end up with multiple collateral damage sites all over the DNA, which can, any one of which can turn a harmless food into a deadly one. Well, and I think that's what's, What's interesting to me when I'm always looking for non-GMO verified uh, products, it's because I don't because I know that they'll have been sprayed with Roundup, right? That's my concern is because I don't want to get the Roundup in my body, and it's very interesting that it doesn't matter if it was sprayed with Roundup or not. It's the crop itself yes. that that is just as damaging as a standalone, and because I've always put the blame on Roundup. Right. Make life is safe. And that's the problem, right? Let's make sure we don't have that. Yeah. But it's the crop itself, um, even without being sprayed, that's just as damaging. I'll give you an example. Dr. Arpad Pustai, a Hungarian-born scientist who is working in the top nutritional research laboratory in the UK, in Aberdeen, Scotland, um, was given $3 million by the UK government to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. He was the top scientist in the world in his field. He he worked with three different institutes to come up with the protocols that Europe was going to use to evaluate safety for GMOs before it was allowed into the country, into the various, the entire EU. And he was a pro-GMO scientist and figured it was just an advance on, on natural breeding like they try and pretend. And he developed the protocols and he put some rats through, through the protocol with a genetically engineered potato. And the potato was engineered to produce an insecticide. Now he had studied this insecticide, this lectin, for seven years, and he knew it was safe. In fact, he invented the field of lectin research, and this was the lectin he knew most about. So it was like he was, he was dialed in. This is not a problem. And he fed the potatoes that produced the lectin to a group of rats, fed another group of potatoes that were natural, the same type of potato that were not genetically engineered to another group of rats. And a third group was fed natural potatoes but their meal was spiked with the lectin that the GMO produced. So we have the GMO producing the lectin. We have the non-GMO potato not producing the lectin. Then you have a non-GMO potato, but then you just add the exact same amount of the insecticide or lectin that the GMO produces into that meal. Now that group didn't have a problem. The non-GMO group didn't have a problem. Only the group that ate the GMO potato that was engineered to produce its own lectin. Wow. So it wasn't the lectin, it wasn't the insecticide that caused the potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, the smaller brains, livers, and testicles, the partial atrophy of the liver, and the damaged immune system in just 10 days. It was not the insecticide that caused the problem. It was the process of genetic engineering that caused the massive collateral damage. Now. When Dr. Arpad Pustai found out about this, he was invited to speak on television and with permission from his director, Professor Philip James, he went on TV, was interviewed, they cut his interview down to two and a half minutes and he said he, does, he, he found some problems but he didn't go into details because it hadn't been published yet and he didn't think it was appropriate to use the, the population as guinea pigs. Well, it aired and he was a hero. All of a sudden, here's a top scientist in the world, the researcher of choice, probably the most knowledgeable researcher in terms of how to research for safety on GMOs, saying GMOs are inherently unsafe. So there was tremendous interest. I mean, there were phone calls off the hook. The professor, Philip James, the director, diverted all the phone calls so he could take them. And he was talking, he was talking praising the research for two days. And he was being groomed this whole time in the past by, by Tony Blair, the prime minister, to be in charge of a new food safety authority. He got a call after 
a day or two from Tony Blair's office was forwarded through the receptionist, so we know. And we've heard that Monsanto first saw this thing going on in Europe, called uh, uh, the Clinton administration, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton called Tony Blair, and Tony Blair's office called Professor Philip James, uh, and the next morning, Arpad Pustai was fired from his job after 35 years, silenced with threats of a lawsuit. They removed the data. They dismantled the team. They never implemented the protocols. And they even put out information about his research designed to discredit him and the research, even though they put out information that was entirely wrong, describing an experiment that he never did. Well, seven months and one heart attack later, he was able to speak because the order, by the order of parliament, he was invited to testify. They had to give him his data back. It's now published. And at the time, it was the most in-depth animal feeding study on GMOs ever conducted. And what, what year did all this take place? This, he, he was, his original uh, TV show was in August of 98. He got his gag order lifted on February 16th, 1999. Uh, in fact, I opened my book, Seeds of Deception, with the scene when Susan answered the door. She saw several reporters standing in front of her and others parking of cars or running across the street. But you all know we can't speak about hep what happened. We would be sued. It's okay, the reporter from Channel 4 TV said to her and handed her the piece of paper. And while Arpod was reading the gag order being lifted, the 30 reporters slid past them into the living room and he looked up and he could finally speak about what he knew about. Wow. And the information that he conveyed created a firestorm of coverage, over 700 articles written in one month alone in the UK and also many others in Europe, hardly anything in the US. But within 10 weeks of that gag order being lifted, Unilever said, okay, no more GMOs in Europe, in our European brands, the next day Nestle's, the next week everyone else. So the tipping point of consumer rejection occurred as a result of the coverage in Europe. But the same companies that took it out of their European foods, continued to feed it to unsuspecting Americans because we didn't have the coverage. Project Censored, a U.S. media watchdog group, described this whole event as one of the 10 most underreported events of the year. Now, I interviewed Pustai more than any other reporter for hours and hours and went over the details. And one thing that I always asked the people that I interviewed was, what was your most shocking moment? I figured I'd open the book with it, but it wasn't the moment that I opened the book, because it wasn't being fired from his job. It wasn't discovering the damage from the rats. Here was a man of integrity and science whose most shocking moment came when he was able to review the submissions by the biotic industry that got their products approved in Europe. It got them approved in England and approved in Europe. When he read them, which was before he discovered the problem with the rats, he, was, he said it was complete mind-blowing shock for him that, this, that they would allow crops onto the market with that superficial, poor, bad science. And he realized when he discovered the problem with the rats and his potatoes that it was a generic process of genetic engineering that caused the problem. The same process that was used on the, on the of the soybeans and corn and tomatoes that were already on the market in Europe. So they never checked for potentially precancerous cell growth. They never weighed the organs. They never looked at the functioning of the immune system or the health of the liver or a half a dozen other things. And so he was aware that what was happening to his rats may be happening to the entire population. It was like a population. big human experiment Except, with no boundaries. And no control yeah. group and no monitoring. No results. And now, and so I was just interviewing... Um, Michelle Perrault, who's the pediatrician in the film, Secret Ingredients, I was just talking to her, and she said when she was looking at Arpad Pustai's, the pictures of the potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, it was an aha moment. She saw it in my book, the second book, Genetic Roulette. She says, oh my God, this is what's happening to the kids. All of a sudden, the kids who were, you know, she had a baseline. She was practicing for years. She had been good through pediatric uh, you know, training, and she had a baseline. All of a sudden, the kids got really sick everywhere, an epidemic of new problems, and it came right after GMOs were introduced, and they'd been eating it for a while, and then she saw what happened to Arpad Pustai's rats and goes, aha. Then she started putting kids on an organic diet, and they started getting better much more than 
before because so when yeah. were so just for our listeners when were gmos introduced into our food sources when so, did we start seeing that happen and how did that come about you well, know no approval right just, just like we talk about the, the this massive human experiment with no you know no boundaries and when did this come into play when was this this allowed to start happening well they started genetically engineering organisms in the 70s. Uh, in the 1980s, they used genetically engineered bacteria to produce a supplement called L-tryptophan in Japan. They didn't respect the fact that so many things can go wrong when you genetically engineer. And unfortunately, there were contaminants that were almost certainly from the genetic engineering process that entered the tryptophan. And that resulted in a deadly epidemic, it killed about 100 Americans and caused five to 10,000 to fall sick or become permanently disabled. The FDA, which was mandated to promote GMOs, hid the evidence. They hid it from Congress. They never mentioned it. They banned all tryptophan from the marketplace, even though only the company that genetically engineered the bacteria created the tryptophan that caused the problem. And people have been taking tryptophan for years. People taking the other company's tryptophan didn't have the problem. They ignored the evidence, got tryptophan off the market. It helped Prozac sales, and it demonized natural remedies, which of is course. part of the FDA's of mandate. Yep. They actually had a mandate. They, you could see the internal memos of determining how they can eliminate the com competitors to the um, pharmaceutical prescribed, food, prescribed drugs. So then they were also told in the uh, Bush administration, first Bush administration, to promote GMOs because the Bush administration was facing a, a trade deficit, and that was bad. And so they put Dan Quayle, the vice president in charge of the Council of Competitiveness, a high-level uh, committee to try and increase U.S. exports. And for some reason, Monsanto, the big GMO maker, convinced them that allowing GMOs to go forward would increase U.S. exports and U.S. domination of world trade of food. The opposite happened. We lost a lot of exports because of it, but they were convinced of it. They told the FDA, promote it. The FDA pulled in Monsanto's former attorney, Michael Taylor, to be in charge of FDA policy when the GMO policy was being created. He said, no problem, no testing, no labeling. Companies like Monsanto could determine on their own if their GMOs were safe. Then he became Monsanto's vice president. Under Obama, he returned to the FDA as the U.S. food czar. And seven years after this no testing, no labeling, no nothing facade of a policy was put into place because of a lawsuit, the FDA was forced to turn over 44,000 secret internal memos. And I talked to Stephen Drucker, who was the pioneer of that lawsuit, who wrote Altered Genes, Twisted Truth. He said it was the biggest fraud perpetrated on the American people because he read the actual quotes from the scientists at the FDA who were mandated with figuring out what the policy should be. And they said GMOs are not the same they're different and they lead to different risks and they can lead to allergens and toxins and new diseases and nutritional problems and they need testing and they need human testing. And what did the policy say? The policy said they're no different, no testing is needed. And they even said the FDA is not even aware of information showing that the foods are significantly different, even though it was the consensus of their own scientists that that sentence was not true. So it was a fraud. And unfortunately, it was the mandate from the White House because when they submitted this policy to the White House, to the Office of Management and Budget, to the Health and Human Services, to the White House Council, the response they got back was, it has to be even more pro-GMO. Eliminate those 12 pages of environmental problems. Make it clear that GMOs are more precise and at least as safe, if not safer. So as it went up the political chain, GMOs got safer and safer. But it turns out they've always been this very unsafe, very dangerous technology. In fact, the most common result of genetic engineering is surprise side effects. So what we have now are GMOs on the market, soy, corn, cotton, which is used for cottonseed oil, canola, sugar beets, not the, sugar, not the beets we buy, the sugar we eat. Most sugar is from beets, not sugar cane. The, the alfalfa, all those six are either Roundup ready or there's soy, corn, and cotton that are also producing Bt toxin. This is really a revelation to people that they genetically engineer a gene into the crop 
so that the crop is now officially registered as a pesticide. And when we eat the corn, we eat pesticide in every bite, a pesticide which is designed to break open the little holes in the walls, the guts of insects to kill them. And in human cell trials, it breaks open the same size holes in human cells. And we find now in rats and in pigs and evidence that it's causing severe problems in the digestive tract. So we're assuming, and I think we're right, that it's contributing to the digestive problems in humans. Yeah. I mean, so here we have this issue of like, we're supposed to trust these people and these powers that be with our health and with what we're doing and our food and all those things. And I mean, you pointed out many things as you were going through that, where there were issues, you know, exports were supposed to go up, they went down, they should have done research, but you know, they didn't need to do research and they just covered and covered and covered and covered. It smells a lot like money to me. Um, but I, you know, and Has we all know. Aroma or- <laughs> yeah, it really does. Odor maybe. <laughs> um, which we already know, but all the while we're trusting these people and our health is deteriorating. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a good segue into, let's talk about the research we're seeing. You've touched on this a lot with first, we have them introduced in the seventies. It's going into our food sources. Now here we are. I should say the crops came out in 1990s. So there was a, well, they started with the seventies and they started messing around with it. And the crops came in the nineties, like soy and corn came in 96. Yeah. And here we are now. Let's talk about the research related to health and what we're seeing with health and, and tying that to introducing GMOs Absolutely. into food. You know, I'm going to do it in a way that I think is, I do this in the film Secret Ingredients. Um, I mentioned it. Um, but I'll, I'll actually give a, a longer piece here because it. I have to. I have to fess up. I have to confess that I had been traveling. I've been to 45 countries speaking about GMOs. And at the time that I'm talking about, it was about 25 countries into it. I had talked about our pod Pustai's research just 10 days into a, a potato diet, not just potatoes. It was a complete and balanced diet. Potatoes were added. The rats were, were devastated in their health. But people would come up to me and say, you know, I, I can tell when I eat a GMO. And I'm like, huh, really? You know, I, I, I was very respectful, but I was very skeptical. I didn't really expect that humans would be able to tell the difference. I expected that it would be some kind of disease that would come, that would be rising in the background and you wouldn't see it till you collected all the statistics. But I started to train or educate doctors about the health dangers. I brought the documented health risks to them at medical conferences. And they started to prescribe non-GMO diets. And I started speaking to them in 2006 and every year going to more medical conferences. And at one point in 2009, I returned to the American Academy of Environmental Medicine where I was getting an award for environmental medicine work. And I brought a video camera and I started interviewing some of the doctors who were prescribing non-GMO diets. Now, up until this point, I was focused primarily on scientists. And if there's any scientists listening, I'm about to make fun of you. Um, they might say, converging lines of evidence suggest that I might be cold. <laughs> they, don't, they don't say anything with definitive, this causes this, but not the doctors. They were saying GMOs cause inflammation. GMOs cause, one allergist said, my allergic patients get more allergies. They get higher levels of allergies with GMOs. And they'll tell you that. One woman said to me, I put no, I put all my patients on non-GMO and they all get better. I went, what percentage? See, I'm still skeptical. She goes, I told you all of them, a hundred percent. All right. 98%. I said, how many patients? She took a while to figure it out. Actually counting things, how many per week, you know, how many years. And she said, 5,000. And I realized she had more patients that she put on non-GMO diets and all of the rats and mice that had been force-fed GMOs or Roundup and all the research. And so she was experimenting and had come to a level of confidence. I said, can I come to your clinic and interview the patients? And I didn't, sure enough. It was remarkable transformation, sometimes in three days. Then I went to farmers that same month and they did put cows and pigs on non-GMO and they were seeing the same thing. A, A pig farmer said, yeah, my pigs no longer have diarrhea. In one of two clinics I visited in Chicago, it was my irritable bowel went away. 
or my Crohn's disease symptoms went away. Similar symptoms, different species, same change. Now with the humans, they may be reducing processed foods or eliminating gluten or dairy, but you don't have gluten-free pigs or dairy-free cows, right? So it's like, wow, I see the same thing. Now I'm getting convinced that people actually can experience the difference, especially when doctors are reporting it for thousands of patients. And then I asked, started to ask people where I was lecturing, how many people noticed a change and hands would go up. But I wouldn't stop there. I'd said, what did you notice? People say, okay, uh, acid reflux or bloating or irritable bowel. So I would say, okay, who, how many others have noticed improvement in digestion? Most, that was the, always the largest group. Then someone would say skin conditions or acne, eczema, very large group. The second largest group was reduced brain fog and increased energy. People would lose weight, autistic symptoms. It was dramatic. There were 28 different, when I put them all together, 28 different conditions that were reported over 150 lectures. And many of those lectures were to medical groups, so the doctors were speaking on behalf of thousands of patients. So we started, to, we surveyed at the Institute for Responsible Technology. And you can go to responsibletechnology.org and sign up and be part of the next survey. Um, at, we surveyed people who and said, did you, did you notice a change when you switched to non-GMO and largely organic food? And sure enough, digestion was number one, fatigue was number two, weight loss was number three, brain fog was number four. Then you have depression and anxiety is the next one. And joint pain, seasonal allergies, gluten sensitivity, uh, high blood pressure, all these different things, diabetes. And it's just, they, and, and, and many of them are, are completely gone when, they, when, when all they do is switch their diet. Not everyone that way, but certainly there were some. So now we have people getting better. We have pets getting better. We have petsandgmos.com. We have stories from, from veterinarians and pet owners. We have livestock getting better. Then if you look at the animal feeding studies when they force feed the animals, the GMOs and the Roundup, they suffer from these similar disorders or their precursors. Then if you look at the statistics, how are those diseases doing in the United States? You look at them and all of a sudden they start rising in parallel with the increased use of GMOs or the Roundup sprayed on them. Now that's correlation, it doesn't prove a causation, but what helps the, the whole picture is if you look at what actually the modes of action are for GMOs and Roundup and BT toxin, you would predict those same problems. And, and I think we should look into that. What is it that the GMO or the Roundup or the BT toxin can do that can cause those problems? So now we have evidence from people, pets, livestock, lab animals, and, co and correlative charts that all point to this may be... All the trends are going up. Uh, this may be one of the worst health nightmares we're facing. And the good news is, as you'll see in the film Secret Ingredients, next week, people get better when they switch to organic. Yeah. And people are waking up. And so you said that GMOs are banned in Europe. No, I said that there was a tipping point of consumer rejection, so the food companies got rid of it. Got it. Not the, there, there's a lot of countries that don't allow it to be planted, but no one in Europe has banned the eating of GMOs. It's the food companies that have banned the selling of it because of consumer concern. And, and is that still current to this day? I mean, is Nestle still eliminating the GMOs from the products that they're selling in Europe? Oh, yeah, except animal feed. Uh, the animal feed. That was my next big question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So right now, I mean, they never really did the animal feed thing in Europe. So most of the animal feed is still GMO for the milk, meat, and eggs, and the vast majority is in the United States. It just uh, there's some retailers in Europe that have have committed to and followed through on their commitment to not allow animal feed, but it's in most of the of the meat and milk and eggs products. Highly frustrating. Just just hearing you talk about it and knowing, I mean, this is 20 years, right, ago that the studies came out and things happened and we, it's 2019 and we're still having the conversation. The lies are still happening. I mean, what, what what's the new law that came out now with the QR code now, right? So, oh my God. So, you know, the, the, the big fight to have GMOs be labeled now, you know, nutritional companies 
can put a QR code and now you have to take a picture of it with your phone and then it can tell you if it has GMOs have, in it, right? Then you have to navigate on their website to find out where that answer is. Yeah, so we we were fighting, and, and by the way, we will, we will get back. I, I do want to talk about how we get hammered by Roundup and how Roundup is not just in non-GMO, which is why I talk about organic. So you talked about, Jonathan, about going non-GMO verified. I'm going to challenge you to go all, you probably do anyway, all whole hog organic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And absolutely. I think that's we, we, we do both. Talk. Good, good. Well, it's, I think it's yeah. an important point for the listeners. I was thinking about that as you were talking that I absolutely wanted to cover that. Let's talk about organic versus non-GMO and the difference between the two and why they're both important. Because I think that's, that's a concept that for people who have never been exposed to this before, um, they're hearing non-GMO, they're hearing organic. And you know, when you're in the store, how do you choose? Right. Why do you choose what you're choosing? And I think, you know, that's what people need to understand. They need to hear what they're selecting when it comes to their labels on their Okay, food. I'm going to give the bottom line, then I'm going to explain why. The bottom line is, if you have to choose between organic or non-GMO, even the non-GMO project verified, organic is more important. And the best thing is to have both on the same label. Is this USDA certified organic? Yes. Okay, I just want to make that clear for listeners. So well, that, you can not you know, allow... a lot of people say organic. You know, we talk about that. A lot of people say organic or natural, but we're All talking... Right, so when you use the word organic on a label, it's regulated. If it's a food, you can't just put the word organic there unless you're right. going with the, or you, with the USDA definitions. Um, but natural means nothing. Let's be clear. You know, let's be a word cop here. If something says natural, just cross that out and read the actual ingredients. Yep. All right, so <clears throat> why do I say organic is more important? Well, let's just talk about Roundup for a second. Roundup, we know, is sprayed on the six major GMOs. There's also five GMOs that are not sprayed with Roundup, and we'll, we'll cover those too. And we want to avoid both the GMOs and the Roundup. But Roundup is also sprayed on grains just before harvest. It's sprayed on wheat, barley, rye, oats, it's sprayed on the beans and legumes like lentils and kidney beans and mung beans. It's sprayed on potato fields and sweet potato fields, in citrus orchards, in vineyards. It's found in our orange juice, in our wine. It's found all over the food supply in beer. And it is found because it is sprayed on non-GMO products just before harvest as a desiccant to dry down the product before harvest. And so that's, it just, it's right there. It goes into the crop. It's, you can't wash it off. It's systemic. It gets driven right into the crop. And some of the highest concentrations are not on GMOs. Certainly the GMOs are high concentrations, but oats are through the roof. Kidney beans through the roof. So in order to avoid Roundup, you, if you just do non-GMO, you get a non-GMO loaf of bread or non-GMO oatmeal. Oatmeal's huge. Has, I mean, they found... Roundup or glyphosate, which is the active ingredient, the main poison. They found residues in, in all these oat breakfast cereals for children. Non-GMO still has the, oat, has the oats, has the Roundup. So that means you have to go organic. Organic doesn't allow either Roundup or GMOs, and it doesn't allow a lot of other stuff like atrazine and neonicotinoids and other things you've never heard of or maybe you have and you want to avoid if you've heard of them. So that's, that's one reason why I say organic. Now, I also said organic and non-GMO project verified on the same label is actually the best possible thing because in organics, you don't have to test for GMO contamination. But if you get non-GMO project verified and you ha have any at-risk ingredients, then you do have to get tested. So if they're on the same label, then it's not only not allowed, but if there's contamination, it's likely to have been discovered. And then if there's contaminants above the threshold, then it's then it's diverted to, to a, a different source. I think that's so important for people to understand. I mean, it's not just do non-GMO or do organic. Organic, non-GMO because of the process that occurs with the food and harvesting the food. I don't know that a lot of people truly understand that full process. And I think it's so important to educate people on that help them to understand why having both and a lot more now you're seeing that on labels right. organic and non-gmo and the thing is this it's 
I'm being clear because a lot of people will put non-GMO on their own. Uh, non-GMO project verification does require the testing. If you just put the word non-GMO, then you get to decide what your test is. That's your choice. And so you may or may not test it. You may simply have affidavits. You may simply tell your suppliers it's non-GMO. If it's organic, it's not allowed to be GMO. And so the only reason why I put two there is that if it says non-GMO project verified, it means that if there's at-risk ingredients, if there's soy or corn or cottonseed oil, it wouldn't be cottonseed oil probably because almost all of it's GMO, um, it, will be a, it will be tested uh, at the input stage just to make sure it's not above their 0.9% threshold. So it's an added bonus. But in reality, organic is not allowed to contain GMOs. So it is by nature non-GMO. Um, now, it's not going to be necessarily 100% pure all the time. It's the nature of nature. Pollen travels. Wind blows. Glyphosate is found in the rain and in the air because it's the most used agricultural chemical in history. So even products that are isolated, grown carefully as organic, may have a small amount. And that's something we all have to accept because that's the facts. So we minimize our exposure by going to organic. It's not a 100% guarantee. And so I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, no, I think it's a really important point. And I think all of this has been fascinating today and and you know we are going to cover more in a, in a in another podcast with jeffrey but and i think it's going to be a great segue into what we're covering next we're going to talk a little bit more about the myth versus truth when it comes to gmos we're going to talk about detoxing from gmos now we've talked about how this came about the issues that we're facing the fraud that's happened the money that's behind this um we've talked about how it's impacting our health especially in america and we're excited when we come back with Jeffrey again, we're gonna talk about detoxing from GMOs. We're going to educate you more on um, information around it. We're gonna talk a little bit more about secret ingredients, your documentary. And so, yeah, this has been very fascinating today. I know I've learned a lot and I'm sure the listeners have as well. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't wanna stop talking, by the way. I wanna <laughs> just keep going. So we, we, we'll, we'll roll into a second podcast here in just a minute. I just want to make sure that we wrap this up and make sure that everybody goes to secretingredientsmovie.com. Um, register there so you can watch it for free. Share this with your friends, with your family, your mom, your dad. Everybody needs to know about this. I mean, we're going to talk more about it, but it's um, it's a damn shame that, that it's gone this long and that people are still getting educated. So do your part. If you're awake, if you've been woken up during this podcast, you've been awake for years, um, you kind of owe it to the rest of humanity to share this movie with others and help wake more people up so that we can make a difference. We've done a lot of podcasts where we talk about the importance of organic ingredients in your supplements, right? And, you know, talking about supplements are a high concentration of that plant or ingredient. And if you're not getting an organic or non-GMO, now you're just getting high concentrations of Roundup, glyphosate, and all these other things in your supplements. So, um, it's very important to us and we're very passionate about it. And so I love having you on the show, Jeffrey. I don't want to stop talking about it, but I am going to end part one here. Um, please, everybody, go to secretingredientsmovie.com. You can also go to empoweringyouorganically.com for the show notes and you will find all of the links to all of Jeffrey's books, to all of his documentaries, um, and anything else you need as we uh, talk about different research that's happened and, and we can give different resources on, and all of that. So thank you everybody for listening and we will see you on part two. Have a great day, everyone. Stay feeding.